Finally tonight, a history of humanity told a hundred ways. Jeffrey Brown has our book conversation. A two million year old stone chopping tool from Tanzania, a double headed serpent from around the 16th century in Mexico, a credit card issued in the United Arab Emirates in 2009. Just three of the objects that, according to a new book, help us understand our past and who we are today. The book is a history of the world in a hundred objects, all of which are taken from the British Museum, which has been collecting objects for more than 250 years. The author is Neil McGregor, director of the museum, and he joins me now. And welcome to you. Thank you very much. Now, we go to museums like yours, right, and we look at things, stuff, but the contention here is that you can pick a hundred of these things and somehow draw a history of the world? Uh, yes, quite a <laughs> brave contention. What we were trying to do was argue that actually when you go to a museum, the big thing is really to focus on a single object. Choose one and get into it. And if you take one object and go into it in depth, then you learn a lot about the people that made it, why they made it, the world it was for, and what it is to be a person needing objects, making objects. You learn a lot about us, mm -hmm. almost any object. And then in this case, you put a bunch of objects, a hundred objects together. Yes. We chose a hundred that go from the very beginning of human history, of making things. So the first things we make are about two million years ago. And we start there, and we wanted to keep going around the world at different moments in history, up till today, to so see what, what have we made and why have we made it? That's the interesting thing. Why have we made these things anywhere in the world? And what do they tell us about us? Well, tell me about that first one, that earliest one. Right? This is just about the oldest thing that anybody like us made, made about nearly two million years ago in Tanzania in East Africa. And it looks just like a cobble, but in fact, the top ridge there has been chipped away very carefully to give a sharp edge. And these are the tools. This is the Swiss Army knife of the Stone Age. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's this kind of tool that lets us all leave Africa and live everywhere because this lets you strip the meat off the animals to get more protein, break the bones, get the marrow. Then you can use it to take the branches off the trees, skin the hides. This is what lets us become us, as become you say in the beginning. It us. allows people to, to eat better, to grow better, to develop better brain, everything, right? Everything. Everything yeah. comes from that. Yeah. And we, having made this thing, we now depend on it. And for the, most of human history, this is the most important technology. This is the technological discovery of humanity. All right, now, you describe that one as a first one, but how do you pick the objects? I mean, there must have been, must have been was it fun? Was it, it was were the there a lot of arguments the about? Huge arguments. Yeah. Uh, it was the greatest fun ever because the idea was that we would spin the world and say, what's going on around you know, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago? In spin China. the world and take walks through your own museum. And take walks through your museum, exactly, yeah. and walk yeah. through time. Yeah. And what's going on in China, what's going on in Mexico, in Egypt. And the thing then lets you go on this walk into another world. They open the poetry of, of another existence that we can only know through the things because mm -hmm. obviously nobody wrote what they were doing with this. So we've got to take the thing, imagine it, and recover it. Well, one interesting aspect that comes through as I flip through here, you often cite the impact of an object in its own era, but then through time, in different eras. A famous example, of course, is the Rosetta Stone, one of your most yes. famous objects. Yes. It had its own time, but then through the Napoleonic era and up to our own. That's, that's the great joy of objects, that they're made for one purpose, and then over time they do something completely unexpected. The Rosetta Stone is actually a tax break between the king and the church. Right. Uh, the Greek king says that uh, he'll give the priests a tax break if they pray for him. Fine. And this is announced on the stone tablet and dozens of copies all through Egypt. Then that all ends, all breaks down, ruins, whatever. And in the 17, late 1790s, when the French have invaded Egypt, they start digging up to fortify themselves at Rosetta. They come across the stone. And then the British arrive to stop the French taking Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> so we get into a different sort of history, yeah, right? Sort of history of, of, uh, of European uh, Europe, uh, another power and colonialism. European struggle, the beginning of European colonialism yes, in Egypt. Yes. And then this object, which has the Greek and the Egyptian on it, is studied by the whole of Europe. And it's that object that now tells us how we can read ancient Egypt. But nobody making the stone 
ever thought to start with that they were going to provide the code for hieroglyphics. Never crossed their mind. And that's what's wonderful about objects. They, they mean different things as time goes on. Uh, of course, another uh, interesting aspect of this is many things simply don't survive, right? So we don't know about some of the missing pieces no. of history. The, that's the, and obviously we only have bits and pieces of the story. And the, oh, the main things that don't survive, of course, are textiles or things made of wood in wet climates. Right, so, I notice you, when you get to a piece of clothing, you say something about it, we're halfway through, we're a million years into human history. And this is our first It's the first cloth. piece of exactly. cloth. That yeah. survives. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, and of course, paper doesn't survive very often. And, and so, so it's very patchy. But that's, that's another part of the game, because it means you have to imagine what didn't survive and remember what didn't survive. What about, I want to go to the last object of, yes. uh, of the book. It's a solar-powered lamp. Now, you write here that it was hard to decide what should be the last thing, right? Because now yes. you're up to our own era. Yeah. We wanted to choose an object that would tell us about the world today um, and this extraordinary global world we live in where we're all in constant contact with each other. We thought we'd go back to the beginning of the story the way somebody in East Africa was using an object to change their life. Mm -hmm. And this is now changing the life of millions of people in the tropics. It's a solar panel which powers both a lamp and a mobile phone recharger. And with this lamp, anybody working in a hut, living in a hut, away from mains electricity, for the first time, has light at night. This means they can read, they can study. It also means they don't need to have kerosene lamps, so it's better for health. With the mobile phone charger, they can sell their produce better in the local markets. This is evening up the great divide between the city and the country among the poorest people on the planet. And the technology is, of course, American. Mm -hmm. The micro-technology was invented in the US. It's fabricated in China and sold in Africa. And it's another tool that's going to let us change the world. So the story continues. The story continues. Let me ask you finally, this, was, uh, this book was based on, uh, I gather it was an enormously popular BBC radio program, right? Now, uh, the book was a bestseller in Britain. Now it's out here. What do you think is, it is that um, grabs people so much about uh, looking at things like this? I think that the... The, the point is that a single object lets you explore a world that you want to know about. We all want to know a bit about what it is like to see the world from uh, Sudan or from Korea or from Mexico. And it's, but it's difficult to read long books on that. A thing lets you journey immediately into another world. And it's a thing made by somebody like you with hands like yours, a mind like yours. And you're on a journey of poetic imagination to a place that you could never reach otherwise. All right, we're going to continue this conversation online. We'll go through the entire history of the world. Uh, but for now, <laughs> Neil McGregor is the director of the British Museum, and his new book is A History of the World in 100 Objects. Thanks so much. Thank you.